If I take a step back and try and think back to what was going through my mind, quit a really good job, no industry experience really whatsoever. No consumer package good experience, no startup experience, no fundraising experience. This is Simon Duffy, AKA the guy who started Bulldog Skincare back in the mid 2000s. And then a little over a decade later, sold it to Edgewell Personal Care, the parent company of Schick, Banana Boat and Playtex. Today, Bulldog is reported to do more than a hundred million dollars globally. You have to make a start. I've spoken with people that get in touch and say, I've got a great idea. And often it is a good idea. And then the challenge comes in just getting the momentum to start something for the first time. What makes Simon's insight so treasured is that he's known for building industry altering, disruptive brands. And he does it by asking some very simple questions. Why have these huge companies that have all of the advantages in terms of expertise, marketing, relationships with retailers, not been able to crack this? white space in the category. The earliest stage is just trying to identify a big problem that no one else has been able to fix. On today's show, I speak with the entrepreneur, visionary, and disruptive brand builder, Simon Duffy. So Simon, I've got to note some of the crazy achievements that you've had over the last 15 years. Okay, so first of all, you worked for one of the world's largest ad agencies. Then in 2006, you struck out on your own and launched Bulldog Skincare. You were able to scale that to eight figures plus and then actually exit it, sell it for a ton of cash. Now you're looking to repeat your success with your latest venture, Waken Mouth Care. Now, from the outside, it looks like you've you've really developed some kind of Kentucky Fried Chicken secret <laughs> spices, secret formula for being able to look at an industry, create a disruptive brand, go in there, shake things up. So where I want to start the conversation, if you can, how do you assess an opportunity like with Bulldog, like with Waken? Good question. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure there's a total formula, to be honest. Like, I'm still very much figuring all of this stuff out as we go along. I think I think there's consistencies between um, how we thought about Bulldog, how we thought about Waken. One of those would be that we see a huge category challenge to be addressed that the big companies already in the market aren't doing a good job at. So for example, in men's skincare, men's grooming with Bulldog, it was about you know 90% of women are using beauty products, skincare products, but only 15% are men. But like, why is that? Why have these huge companies that have all of the advantages in terms of expertise, marketing, relationships with retailers, not been able to crack this white space in the category? The really exciting thing with Waken is dental feels like a category if you sort of put it in the perspective of personal care or health and wellness or other things that you buy in the store where trends like naturals, sustainability, you know, cool independent brands have not yet worked out a formula to disrupt the motherships in mouthwash and toothpaste. It's a really, really interesting challenge when you think about how big this category is and just how behind it is everything else on trends like naturals and sustainability. So part of the, if there is a post process, the earliest stage is just trying to identify a big problem that no one else has been able to fix or, and, and we're not saying that we've totally fixed it yet, but we just, we just want to start with something exciting, something big and bold. I love that. Now, I, I would, I've heard this from entrepreneurs. <clears throat> I've heard this from family of entrepreneurs. I've heard this from lots of people. There's this idea that if people aren't doing it, they're much further ahead. They have better resources. They're smarter. There must be a reason they're not doing it, right? Like, like the first piece of doubt that will always come into your head when you spot an opportunity or when you see something, whether you're creating a new company or something else, is to go, well, if no one's doing this, there must be a reason why. So why spend my time? Why spend my energy? Like, do you ever fall in that trap when you're looking at it? 50% of, of men use skincare, 90% of, of women use it. I would go, well, I guess a lot of men just don't care about it. Yeah. I mean, it'd be really easy to jump to that conclusion, right? You know, like it, it, there's so many reasons not to start something and get get stuck in research or just sort of follow the crowd to really popular areas of consumer products. And in truth, what you were saying, that, that was that was the origin of Bulldog, really. Like I remember it was a, a really cold, wintry day in New York and I was going to the local Whole Foods store to get some skincare products for my wife. Um, huge natural category for women. And I can remember asking the, the whole body person, like, where, where's the men's section? And there just wasn't a section in store. And you think, geez, if it's not in New York City, in the big Whole Foods store, 
perhaps it just doesn't exist. You often hear entrepreneurs say it again, that is the the sort of quote unquote light bulb moment. You know, there's a gap in the market here. No one seems to be doing these sorts of products in these sorts of way. You know, the challenge in then the first phase is to work out, is there a market in the gap? You know, what are the reasons for the fact that there isn't a brand? Is it because formulation is impossible? Is it because consumers don't want to, to buy this stuff? I think that's actually often where big companies trip up in innovation and stuff sort of ends up feeling the same. You know, we, we spent a little bit of time doing that, but I think like with every good business, it does start a bit with a hypothesis. Like you've got to anticipate where the consumer's moving to rather than just sort of ask people where they're at. The moment. You know, an example of that is if we were focus grouping opportunities in male skincare, like how a big company would do it, no one would come up in 2006 with natural ingredients for men because the category itself was so small. No one would even say, oh, I'd definitely be in this category if there was a, if there was a brand named after a dog. You know what I mean? It's like both of those things are, are hypo- hypothesis-driven rather than they come out through sort of asking consumers to create your ideas for you. But that's how I sort of want it to be. I want to sort of have a hypothesis and see if we can build something. And how do you assess... And I, and I mean you, but I mean, how does one... How does one go about assessing... Whether these inklings, these 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 little light bulb moments, these how do you take things further? Being cynical or skeptical enough to not just let your hope and dreams take you down the wrong path, but also not keep things so tightly wound up that it just looks like nothing will ever work all the time. You have to make a start. I mean, I just can't emphasize that enough. I've spoken with you know informally or you know friends or people that get in touch and say I've got a great idea and delighted to always talk with those people and, and often it is a good idea and then the challenge comes in just getting the momentum to start something for the first time. So I think you can do things to de-risk a launch. You know, you can speak to consumers, you can have preliminary conversations with retailers, you can sort of try and understand whether you can make money at sort of certain points depending on how you launch. But ultimately it will be a it will be a hypothesis. You know, that's one way to think about it is the core competence of consumers is to consume. It's not to create. So you can't keep asking people hypothetically, would you buy this if X, if Y, if it was launched in this way, if I had this campaign? Ultimately, it's all about just getting it into market in some way and teasing out the learnings once it's in once it's in market. And then I think really importantly, and we found that with Bulldog and we find that with Waken, once you are in market, you've got to leave your ego sort of at the door. Like no one nails it first time. You know, and actually if you if you think you can sort of come up with a brand or a product, launch it, and then take nothing out of that first two years and not be itching to change it within two months and then six months. And, you know, that is not a sign of weakness. That's a sign of strength. That's a sign that you're listening to uh, sort of important people, stakeholders, consumers as you go along looking to optimize. So that's very much our, our tactic in terms of innovation is start with the hypothesis, get it launched. You know, we want to try and make the best job we possibly can to start with, but then we're learning as we go to try and tweak tease out new routes, change packaging, change ingredients, just to optimize, optimize, optimize. And I think ultimately that's the only way you can prove to yourself that there's something in your initial idea. And it won't happen overnight unless you're very, very lucky. So, you know, Perhaps as a tech entrepreneur, you can build a network really, really quickly. But I think consumer products is takes a bit slower um, to sort of move at the speed of your retailers or you know, other things that may slow you down. That is such a great point. And I hope, I hope we all kind of heard that because often... If I'm speaking to a writer, an author will say, <laughs> listen, this book that you're reading is not the book I wrote. The book I wrote yeah. was three times as long and all over the place and meandering. And then I wrote and then I rewrote and then I rewrote and then editors came in and then they helped me frame. And, and the book you're reading is like this, this, this work that's been workshopped. Yeah. Or if you're, if you're speaking to a playwright or, or anyone in kind of the arts, you think you're watching a movie or something on stage. I come from the film industry. I went to film school. And when my teacher told me, oh, you didn't get everything in the first shoot? In editing, you got to go do pickups. What are, what are pickups? What are you talking about? Well, you realize you've missed something, so you go back out and you reshoot. Yeah. So you can make the story better. Like you just go and plug the holes, fix things. I think often when we're starting, especially if we're starting something new, we somehow feel that we've got to get everything right. And, yeah. and if we don't get everything right right away, we must be a failure of some kind. Mm. 
what you just shared is so inspirational. So how how do you or how did you at the time when you're launching Bulldog, how did you not fall into that trap of beating yourself up or of of just being blindsided with things that you never saw coming? Did this come naturally to you? Did it come naturally? Potentially. Like I think I've always been a bit more comfortable with the idea of risk compared to at least some of my friends, you know, who, who have followed much more conventional paths. Um, if I take a step back and try and think back to what was going through my mind 2005, 2006, that led to the impetus to quit a really good job and start Bulldog with, as you're saying, no, no industry experience really whatsoever. No, yeah. no consumer package good experience. No real entrepreneurial experience, no startup experience, no fundraising experience. I mean, the, the, no, the ex- no retail experience, no, right? No, no. The experience, the, I mean, the experience that I had had was working as part of this team within Saatchi and Saatchi, who latterly became called Fahrenheit 2 and 2. And we were innovation consultants. So we would go and sit with the R&D folks at Starbucks, at Coca-Cola, at Diageo, at Samsung, and we would try and sort of inject a creative problem-solving approach to innovation. See, see, see if we can help them craft better products. You know, Saatchi and Saatchi would solve communication ideas, and the output would be TV ads. We would try and solve innovation challenges, and the output would be new products. So I, I took a lot of um, learning from how these bigger companies think about innovation, both good and bad. But, you know, so there was, I guess, some skills there. But it also just gave me the confidence to think, especially when you sort of think about how slow these big companies are and how long it takes for them to go from initial idea to market launch, how much research they feel they need to do to get it past various milestones in their own processes. There was there was definite a sense that I can actually do this myself. And 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 Rodri, who was my business partner at Bulldog and my business partner at Waken, and we were we, we sort of became really close and it's a good team and it's still a good team. We sort of together thought, yeah, we, you know, we can do it. We can actually come up with ideas. But but sorry to answer your question about risk, I really sort of challenged myself to think, what is the real risk of failure at Bulldog? Like if we launched it and it was a total disaster, and I don't know, three years later we'd lost all of our investors' money. And there was no business. How would I feel? And I actually felt two things. I felt firstly, the experience and learning and self-development and sort of putting myself out of my comfort zone and the challenges I would face would be a hugely formative experience. I'd probably be a better person as a result of that. And I suspect I could probably plug back into the, to a similar industry at a not totally different stage. Um, the other thing I sort of identified was if I look at my own situation, I'm married to Annabelle, my wife now. She's from New Zealand. We were living in New York. I was starting to think, oh, I just want to have a place in New Zealand, a place in London. I want to be able to sort of bounce between the two. I want to be financially unencumbered. I know 100% I'm not going to be able to do that within the sort of salary earning potential of my current job. So I wasn't even giving myself a chance at sort of delivering the lifestyle that I wanted to imagine. And I felt I had much more to lose by not giving this venture a try. And 10 years later, looking back, midlife crisis, you know, doing okay, being the boss, but never even rolling the dice on the lifestyle that I wanted to build for myself, for her, for our, for our family. And I thought that was more risky than actually kicking out and trying to take on p and and Unilever and Nivea in 2006, 2007. Recently, I was lucky enough to have Rand Fishkin on the podcast. He's the founder of Moz and also the author of this book right here, Lost and Founder. And one thing that I love about this book is that at the end, he breaks down everything that went wrong over his 15 years at Moz. And he he also lists everything he's going to do differently when he attacked his next venture. And so I was really curious, as Simon exited Bulldog and looked to his next venture, Waken, like Rand Fishkin, he had this really cool opportunity to try and replicate some of the past wins from Bulldog, but also avoid some of the massive mistakes. It's sort of towards the end of the, the journey with Bulldog, I, I felt like I was becoming more and more a manager of uh, a huge team in a, in a much bigger company. You know, we were bought by a much bigger company than us. And I really was desperate to get back to that feeling of, well, two people sitting at a table with a blank sheet of paper trying to take on Colgate and Johnson & Johnson, who I enlisted in. And that's what I really missed. And I think there, 
there's definitely learnings and things that we can take from Bulldog, but it's a whole new challenge. You know, like the world moves on, you know, the sort of the way that we market brands has changed, channels are changing. We're definitely trying to, where we can identify things that went wrong at Bulldog, rectify it. So one example of that would be around team. You know, at Bulldog, Rodri and I were guilty of trying to do everything ourselves for too long, not collaborating as effectively enough, not not getting experts who are actually way better than us into role quickly. So we we held up the trajectory by sort of being too much into the weeds. And it's really important to try and understand every aspect of your business. But what we've been doing with Waken is we're in terms of the team, we're sort of where we were at Bulldog perhaps year seven in year two. So we put way more resource into putting experts into role sooner because we're sort of hoping to go quicker. Um, there's probably countless other things that we should be doing that we're not doing. Like, for example, we've launched products and we're just itching to improve the way that we communicate the benefits on the front of the pack. And we've learned about flavor and which flavors people like versus which which flavors people perhaps don't like. We're learning all the time about our online business, how to acquire customers, sort of what sort of bundles they want. So as you'd expect, it's you sort of know the things you need to be getting better at, but every single day is about learning and improving and optimizing one small part of the business. Do you ever find yourself looking at everything to do and everything you're hoping would be achieved and looking at results and just have these moments of, I don't want to say hopelessness, because that sounds really bleak, but you know, you know that the ups and downs of entrepreneurship where you're just like, yeah, ah, just like, it shouldn't be this hard, man. It shouldn't be this hard. Yeah. Like, do you find yourself at this point in your life facing those kind of days still? A hundred percent. I mean, it's, um, I guess, second time through, or perhaps first time through, you, you, you're asking yourself, is there some smart strategic pivot we could make? Or <clears throat> are we asking the right questions? Or is there one thing we could do differently, which would have a huge sort of demonstrably better impact and in my experience or where we're at there isn't at waken it's continually trying to optimize one or two percent in 20 or 30 things that i think over a period of years gets you to a you know a big business with a big market share and sort of a clear strategy in all these places and you're okay with that though it doesn't doesn't bother you it doesn't like I, i find that certain people hit a point in their life where they're able to let go of these things where they're like listen you know i can't control it so why spend time on it and then others desperately just try to like rattle the cage, right? Like they just like try to fight the system, even though they know they can't do anything about it, even though they know that's the way it is and they get up every day and they they face it. There's still some kind of tension there against how things should be. I've definitely got better at leaving some of the work stress behind as I've got older. I mean, I have to because I, because when I when I started Bulldog late 20s, it was a hundred percent of what I did. Some days I was working all hours that I could, you know, other days, weekends, I'd be working part of the time. It's, it's a different challenge for me now because, you know, we have three kids, 11, seven and four, and I don't want to bring that stress home to the house. It's not the family that I want to be a part of and it's not stress I want to sort of add into home life. So I have to now be much more focused on certain things when I'm at work and then be able to switch things off as I go home. So from that perspective, yeah, I've probably found it easier to leave some of the stresses at work behind. That I think is, or I think it's a characteristic of successful entrepreneurs is you you talk a little bit about how you define the category challenge, how you bring products to market. And that requires an initial phase of momentum. And then it comes down to guts and determination and just not being shy of hard work. So I know with every entrepreneurial journey. From the outside, it looks like, hey, rocket ship to success. But but no one goes through startup and fundraising and then product launch and getting into retailers and growing and scaling a business. No one, no one <laughs> gets through that clean. Share with me a time where, where really a lot of things were on the line and you realized, oh gosh, we got to do a better job at this. Well, yeah, no, there was this a horrible period actually probably three or four years into bulldog where we were from a financial perspective getting close to the end of the money that we'd raised or had managed to retain from the sort of trading of the business and we were called up to 
um, the merchandising centre of this huge retailer in the UK. And this is where they build out their future plans for for products in stores. And we walked in daunted and nervous, sort of based on the buyer that we knew we were meeting. Had quite a fierce reputation that preceded him. And we turned the corner, and the bulldog assortment on on the shelf was just amazing. There was like twelve products. It was eyeline. It was like massively exceeded our expectations about how it would end up. And we were like, wow, that's that's incredible. Thank you. And, and the bar turned around and said, yeah, it's not going to happen. We, we've done everything we can. We wanted to do this for you, but, you know, your sales are terrible. I've asked you to do this. You haven't done it. I've asked you to do this. and You've been slow to do this. I'm going to have to delist you completely. And at that point, we were thinking, this is game over. Because because the retailers tend to, to not always, but they, they're very aware of what's happening and elsewhere. So if you lose momentum in one place, it can just sort of, spread throughout the whole market. Hold on, so, hold on. So, so, yeah. so you walk you walk into this into this like um R and D showroom or something that has yeah. all of the shelves and and your product is beautifully displayed exactly yeah. where you want it and you're completely excited, followed by by the way, we're pulling everything off the shelves. It's probably some neat sales trick that they teach you, but I mean it was from uh from like the best possible expression of the brand that we'd ever seen we were told that we were going to get delisted from the from the biggest retailer in the uk at that time and it was a, it was definitely a a moment of um sort of questioning whether we had the right product whether whether we had wasted our, our time to date and the key thing i think that we took from that was we really tried to understand with this difficult personality what was the main barrier that was sort of preventing him from believing in the potential that we had? Because we certainly hadn't delivered to date, you know, the fact-based evidence to suggest that we did deserve to sort of retain. And it came down to packaging. We hadn't yet optimized the packaging to sort of get people to to want to try it. There was a disconnect between when people use the product, oh, that's really nice. I really enjoy this. So when they looked at the pack, a lot of people were saying, um, this isn't for me. And the challenge is a very small business with limited resources is that at that moment, I think we identified we need to change the pack. But it was a very difficult decision to make when you've got a warehouse full of 200,000 units or whatever it was of old packaging, which would then become obsolete. And I think it's hard, but you have to sort of treat feedback as a gift. And it would, have, I think, been easy to ignore that and try and just sort of carry on. But it was a real moment where we decided to right we really have to wrap our hands around this problem that's probably if we've been fair been at the back of our minds is we haven't quite cracked the different elements of how we're communicating the story through the packaging so we went back we redesigned it we figured out what to do with all of this obsolete stock and then we sort of rebuilt up from a really really reduced footprint in this retailer it was definitely a backward step for a couple of years we like shrunk the assortment right down but in retrospect a really galvanizing thing in terms of people, our rate of sale went up. Like we felt the new version of the products that were provoked by that really drove uh, more intention to purchase by people in the UK. And it was also actually really galvanizing internationally. Like at that point, we were trying to build our business in Sweden, build our business in America, just in Whole Foods and the natural speciality channel. So doing it in a small controlled way. And the new packaging that was all came from this really horrible meeting empowered that actually. So that was probably quite, a, in a small way, quite a big turning point for the for the brand in about year three, year four, something like that. Oh, that is that is a good lesson right there. One that's hard, but so good. And I'm sure you're going to agree, viewer. Like, you know, you're an ambitious leader. You're a creator. And so it is so painful when in your heart of hearts, you know that you're not delivering at the level you want to be delivering at. Like, here's a perfect example. If you're producing content and you find your content boring, trust me, Everyone else finds your content boring too. If if you have a product and you're not excited about what you're putting out, why would anyone else be excited about your product? And so I want you to imagine being in Simon's shoes, having all your hopes riding on the steel, having this product sitting there on the shelf in the warehouses. You know, you've got to ditch all of that stuff in the warehouse. You got to take the time and money to invest to fix everything. And you have to slow down. But in the end, three, four years later, he's looking back and saying it was worth it. It was. It felt a bit aggressive at the time, and it was like a sh you know nerve wracking 
and we did a lot of soul searching. But actually, that really difficult feedback led to a really positive outcome. You know, a different reseller at the time who we were trying to get distribution with for the first time would go up and we'd have meetings and they'd be so polite. They'd be like, we love it. It's like a really good product. I really like you guys. Um, yeah, it's it's a really good story. I think that I've got everything I need. And then nothing ever happened. And I, and I've, I've, I look back on those meetings and think... Perhaps that person was just unwilling to say, I don't like your products to, 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 to two young entrepreneurs who they knew pretty much had everything riding on the success of this business. It's probably hard in that moment to give difficult feedback. Mm -hmm. I think the lesson is, is that the person who was direct enough to like tell us it was rubbish at that point actually saved the business by just being honest and, you know, in his own aggressive way, managed to precipitate a really positive behavior from the team at Bulldog. So we sort of look back on those times now happily. But at the time, you know, it was compounded because Rodri, who was driving, had like reversed his car into a lamppost and the door was broken. And we and we drove back down the motorway. He had one hand on the wheel, one hand holding the door into the side of his car. In that and meeting? In that on the way back. And the rain was sort of like flying in through this broken door. And I remember we sat in a motorway service station eating a hamburger deciding whether the game was up or whether we could sort of go back to the well, revise the branding, sort of where we still in the fight with this big retailer. And in, in the end, we were, we managed to sort of solve the problem. But at the time, it was, it was daunting. Yeah. I love it. Final question for you, Simon. For you personally, as, as a man, as a husband, as a father, as a business owner, as a, as a marketer, at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Well, for me, it's about challenge. You know, I, 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 um, I think the, what I appreciate most about Waken, and when I look back at the most exciting parts about Bulldog, it was just the opportunity to, you know, set out on an adventure and try and take on these huge companies and doing it with a, with a small team that, that can inspire you day to day would be most proud if we could encourage uh, these big companies that hitherto are sort of behaving in a really, average way I would say to think more sustainably think more positively like an example of that with Bulldog was we launched sort of razor made from bamboo and metal and then latterly we we launched one that was made from recycled beer bottles so it's dramatically less plastic in the the core device dramatically less plastic or no plastic it was sort of packed in cardboard you know you you, you sort of remember five years ago the, the categories all these like plastic device and a plastic tray and a plastic shell that you can't get open without scissors like you look in the category today now everybody is presenting their products in a more sustainable and thoughtful way. And I think that is at least one example of Bulldog acting as a thought leader where perhaps it can't be the share leader. That is what I want to look back on with Waken is the, yes, we we're able to build a business of a, of a meaningful scale and all the excitement that comes with that personally, professionally, financially, but more than anything, like the real why is this is a category that has completely ignored what people want in terms of more sustainable options. Just think about all that stuff going to landfill, the fact that the packaging choices that these big brands make almost mean they have to go to landfill like this. No one is really addressing this. If we could just encourage everybody to revisit the choices that they're making and, and encourage the biggest brands, which would have way more impact than what we could do with Waken to think in a more environmentally positive way, that would be hugely personally satisfying and also like I think really good for the planet really good for consumers who are looking for those products so I think that's what I'd like to be able to 10 years from now that the whole the whole category is behaving in a more positive way and waking as a brand within that <laughs>